And welcome to the Libertarian Affiliate Spotlight, a production of the Libertarian Party Affiliate Support Committee, Valerie Sarwak Chair, and of course, the Libertarian National Committee, Whitney Bilyeu serving as chair. And as always, John Gapso joins us on the big board. I am your host, Pat Ford, and it is my unique privilege to spend time with you Monday and Friday nights discussing what I think are the very best aspects of the Libertarian Party. And of course, what I mean by that are its people. On Friday nights, we celebrate the individual candidacies, the down ballot candidates, folks ranging from well, mass transportation directors. By the way, I have it on a authority that my good friend from Colorado, who we'll talk about very soon, is running again. This time he might have his sights set on higher races. On the Affiliate Support Committee, we talk about the, the true lifeblood of the party state and local affiliates, for whom without this party would not be able to reach into the deepest, if you will, the deepest reaches of the American political electorate. Much responsibility in this party, in our decentralized structure, is based on the skills, the talent, the work ethic, the resources of the state and local affiliates. Joining me tonight is was someone I am proud to call a friend, someone for whom was one of the first folks that came out and supported our efforts in Rhode Island that was not a Rhode Islander, a neighbor and a friend. And of course, I'm talking about Dan Real. He's the chairman of the Connecticut Libertarian Party or the Libertarian Party of Connecticut, depending on who you ask. Dan, thanks for joining me tonight. How are you? How are things in Hotford? Well, first of all, um, I'm in Plainfield, and I think it's the People's uh, Republic of Judea. <laughs> Folks, tonight's not going to be like the other nights. Just warning you. Uh, <laughs> so, so how 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 goes the People's Republic? And and you know, I, it, Connecticut has a, a wide range, if you will, of of various implementations of Soviet workers' paradise. You have the apparatchiks down in you know in uh, Fairfield County down in places like Stanford and Greenwich and, uh, you know, and, and, and Darien. And, and then, of course, you've got the, the plebes from, from Hartford and, uh, and New London. And then you've got the uh, bachelor farmers, gentlemen bachelor farmers up in the northwest part of the state. But all of them, it is clear that without the intercession of the Libertarian Party of Connecticut, would all have taken control of the means of production. Is that a fair statement? Um, I... You know, it's becoming less correct as time goes on because we raised, um, it, it, it seems, uh, and, and, and this is um, an interesting possibility, that people have been somewhat affected by the COVID shutdowns and the restrictions and the masks in school. Um, we kind of thought, you know, maybe we could tap into that issue. It might raise, I don't know, some beer money. So uh, July, that raised four thousand dollars alone on that one issue, and that's excluding other donations. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have actually been distributing unmask our kids signs throughout the state, and the Republicans are just quietly sitting around letting things be destroyed, and uh, they're going to try to take credit for um, not being against it next year, and that's not going to work out too well. Let's 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 go back to the earliest days of the pandemic. And talk about your initial reactions, because Connecticut, in, in a lot of ways, has been on the bleeding edge, if you will, of a response to the pandemic in a number of matters. But let, let's talk about that. What Was it, as in some states, sort of a shock and then awe, where you were, you were shocked the state was actually doing everything that we'd, uh, that we'd preached about? You were then in awe of their ability to do it. And then you rose up and what was the gestation period, if you will, for the response from the Connecticut Libertarian Party? I would probably say it was a solid 15 days of the 15 day lockdown um, by day. It was it was easily by day 16. We were all like, OK, something is wrong. Um, actually, day one was March 16th. Day one, we were doing Hartford Superior Court. 
And uh, on March 13th or 14th, we had our one of our main witnesses, uh, Mike Holman, is a good friend of mine, uh, my former campaign manager. He was actually driving uh, from Minnesota to come to court for this ballot access case. And um, the governor just decided, yeah, we're going to lock you guys out of court. You might win. And um, I had to call poor Mike, who was almost in Chicago, like, uh, sorry, you got to turn around. They're, they're canceling everything. They're, they're canceling my job, my ability to work, my ability to see my kids. They're canceling the court case. Um, friends and own businesses, they're, they're canceling that. Uh, so that's, that's not essential. Um, they're canceling due process. Uh, they're canceling people's right to a speedy trial. Gosh, that guy even, that, that King Lamont, he even canceled habeas corpus. So we uh, we kind of got together. Uh, we we developed uh, this thing, and, and this is this is our vice chair Jonathan Johnson. He's been leading uh, what's called the Liberty Rally, which was which is still holding protests like every week over the lockdown. So when the Democrats and Republicans were kind of just hiding behind this and, and trying to, you know, use COVID to to go after their political enemies and, and get free federal money, we were standing up uh, from day one. So what ended up happening is people started going like, okay, um, the libertarians are here. We have something we can get involved in. Uh, and, and believe it or not, I mean, the Democrats weren't alone in pushing this. I know in the town I live in, uh, we've got a first selectman who I'm running against this year. Uh, he's pretty much used COVID to shut down public meetings, pretty much get whatever pet project he wanted. Uh, actually, he gave himself a raise. And before he gave nice. himself a raise... He gave himself a stipend equal to 3% of his annual pay, which he swore was not a raise. Um, and so this is when it, this is in Plainfield, my town, where um, they we have a poverty rate of 56%, which COVID did not make that better. But the government is essentially out there locally uh, and, and in Hartford saying, let, let them eat shots, let them eat masks. And they're giving themselves a raise when a lot of us have pretty much lost everything. Now, one, one takeaway is uh, I know our party hasn't been perfect about a lot of things, but we've we've slowly figured things out. And uh, one thing we found people respond to, Democrats, Republicans, independents, they go, this this shutdown stuff has gone a little too far. Um, and, and as much as I'm a fan of elections, as I'm sure everybody else watching is a fan of elections, we do have problems we cannot vote our way out of. However, what that means for us libertarians is we have a very real opportunity here because we don't just have an opportunity to raise money from, say, parents who are upset with the masking things to, you know, different uh, civil rights causes and all that other stuff. We have an opportunity to raise money with, you know, the typical special interests who have even been, um, uh, what's the best word, uh, slighted uh, by what the COVID lockdowns have done. There's a substantial amount of money that has been, uh, uh, how do you say, uh, messed with, for lack of a better phrase, mm -hmm. uh, if that makes sense. And that money is on the table. And um, uh, Pat, I know we were, we were talking behind the scenes a little bit in the last few weeks, but uh, we kind of think there's an ability to, to set up a real dialogue with some of these special interest donors and say, Look, um, the Libertarian Party is serious. Um, we have a common we have a common cause. Uh, we know we're not going to get a PCR positive free world, but we've got this vaccine that you know uh, everybody believes in. And so, why are we still doing this? Why are we still shutting down businesses? Why are we threatening more lockdowns? Why are we putting masks on kids? You know, I mean, this is after you know. We've had many people who've missed cancer screenings. You know, we did that in the name of, of COVID. Um, we've deprived kids a whole of a whole year of, of education. Uh, the great news is it, it has led to an unprecedented number of homeschoolers in Connecticut, which, by the way, Connecticut is probably the best state, despite all of our other deficiencies, to actually homeschool. And all you have to do is let your school district know, I'm homeschooling my kid. They can't say, we'd like to look at your curriculum. They can't say... We'd like proof you have this certification. The way the law is here is you can, you know, yeah, just, just set up shop. Just let us know. You won't be sending Timmy to school. And you're doing it yourself. Because believe it or not, in, in a libertarian uh, sense, the General Assembly actually passed a law that shockingly says education of your children is primarily the responsibility of parents. Wow. I know that might sound strange, but... 
the General Assembly actually sometimes does intelligent things. Holy cow. Boy, I wonder where they got that from. <laughs> so let, let's go back to the very beginning a little bit. Uh, talk to me about your Liberty Rallies, how you organize those, who was invited, who participated, and you know what, in, what type of venues and what type of approach did you take to those? We reached out to everybody. Um, and, and we, Connecticut takes this unusual approach of reaching out to people who are not libertarians, which, believe it or not, actually works. Uh, and, and the great part is when COVID happened, there was no framework to deal with this. I know we ended up suing the governor over what they were doing, like locking us out of state court. So the party already went, all right, we've got to do something. I know I teamed up with some people, like one of which, believe it or not, is that I teamed up with two Republicans, my libertarian friend who's also an attorney, and myself, who's a you know a litigation paralegal. And the four of us took on the governor. We took on the lockdown like wholesale, the whole thing. Uh, and that is still in the courts, and we're still fighting it. Um, so that was the first thing that happened. Liberty Rally was kind of an offshoot of it. So slowly what was going on is, is we were growing a few Facebook pages. And, and it ended up being, you know, it ended up being easily like, you know, five, six thousand people like at first, you know, that were actually on the pages. Uh, we've we've drawn protests of a thousand or more. Uh, we've had the regular ones will generally draw in between like 50 to 300. You know, so this is a thing where we want to make it very clear to the governor that, you know, A, this is not right. And B, yes, we can bring people to virtually be in to actually be in the real world, not the virtual. And that's the thing. You've got to, you know, you have to focus on the fact that the government's going to do whatever it wants to do. I mean, this is, this is unfortunately the case. And unfortunately, it's not a matter of persuasion or logic. It's a matter of you have to go out and unlike Democrats and Republicans, we have to earn our votes. We can't just pretend we would like to do something when we get elected. What we're doing and what we have been doing is we're showing people that we'll, we're not going to wait for an election. We're going to go out there and actually do things. Like, we'll bring lawsuits. We'll go to Board of Ed meetings. We'll organize those efforts. Um, I can't even begin to tell you how many people kind of just started contacting us. I mean, I know my phone time, I'm, I'm a hard guy to get. Uh, and that kind of comes with having all sorts of events that I didn't organize. I didn't schedule. I'm just, you know... We, we've got a growing team, and it's excellent, um, and, and our affiliates are growing, and we're it's because we're doing things that are relevant and responsive to your average voter. So um, what do I mean by that? You know, we're actually out there. We're, we're dealing with COVID head on. You know, we're saying there's no such thing as, a, as an idea so good it should be mandatory. Uh, and the other things, we're actually talking about things the voters care about. Like, here's how health care could be made better. Here's how education could be made better. You know, here's why your taxes are so high. Um, and, and while there are other issues out there, I mean, the important thing is we're trying to get to where the average voter is. And and they see us and they hear us more loudly now than ever because, A, we're growing, and B, because when it comes to these COVID restrictions, um, we're, we're demonstrating how unworkable and how untenable it is. And as a matter of fact, uh, one of our largest rallies last year was like right before the election. Uh, I, I basically, you know, was right there at the Capitol. No one was wearing masks. And uh, I told the governor, go ahead. I will not comply. And uh, if you don't like that, um, come down here, find me, have me arrested, and hire the lawyer you like the least. And that's the thing. Um, because the fact is we are dealing with uh, two, one party pretending to be two. And basically their standard for what um, they want to do is can we get away with it? I mean, just recently we saw that with President Biden. He came out. Uh, he was he acknowledged the rent moratorium was um, unconstitutional. He acknowledged that it lost in the Supreme Court. Uh, he didn't acknowledge that Trump started it, which I, as much as I wanted that, uh, we all know that's true anyway. Uh, but he basically said, "I'm going to wing it and uh, I'm going to take a chance." So, uh, in Connecticut, just like everywhere else, we have an unprecedented um, taking. Of, of, of actual property without any due process whatsoever. So uh, this is the critical time, you know, to be out there, to be relevant. And 
you know, to take it on. And, and you can be bold and you can also be relevant and be bold and show exactly why Democrats and Republicans are not good for uh, not just your business, but your, your personal health freedom as well. Absolutely. <laughs> now, yeah. oh, yeah, a little bit after there. Okay. okay. So, question then. Who is the organizing force behind this? What was the method in which you generated, um, if you will, publicity? Where were most of the events held? One of the purposes of this show is to, is to describe best practices or successful efforts by different affiliates and exactly how they can then translate to that to their own affiliate. So after there, a little bit of a trial and error, how did, how did things work best for you folks? How did you actually implement this? Well, first of all, um, we kind of took a hard look at, you know, what's been going on in, in the Libertarian Party history. And one of the easy fixes that we were able to implement is not only do you have to have a message that's directly relevant to voters that affects them in a deep way, COVID kind of stands out. Uh, you also have to, have to have a call to action. Like it can't just be, you know, we want to keep selling you or we want to keep educating you or want to keep philosophizing you. We are basically saying, look, this shutdown stuff is really bad. Them forcing your kids to wear masks is pretty bad, and pretty invasive. Be at this place, protest. Or, you know, kind of like I'm trying to develop, it's like try to, you know, try to get the public records. Actually do Freedom of Information Act requests to get these records to pretty much expose what a lot of these school districts are doing. So if you give people things that are really easy to do, and you get people when they want to act, then then you can you can get that and turn it into a conversion. Uh, one thing that I can say that a lot of our affiliate chairs do, which which is something I also do, oh, uh, you want to find your people that are really good with really specialized skills. Um, we have you know we had an IT person that used to be our secretary. He developed this thing called the machine of knowledge, which it interfaces with the voter database, allows us to find where our people are. Uh, it's something the CRM project, I'm pretty sure, does some functions, but we developed our own in-house models. So we also uh, take advantage. Obviously, I've got a legal skill set. We've got attorneys in the party who have that skill set. You find those people. You Accountants, bookkeepers, treasurer, there you go. Um, get your specialized people to perform those specialized skill sets. But as far as like your, your volunteers go, um, get them involved as locally as possible. So they don't have nearly as far to go. Um, we actually, you know, we have pretty good affiliates like that have that have gotten more like central uh, to municipalities. Like we have a pretty good uh, New Haven one. We've got Meriden's doing pretty good. Hartford is getting pretty solid. Uh, I know in my town, Plainfield, I'm one of three libertarians that are going to be on the ballot. We don't even have to petition, you know, because we've been around enough. You bring up a critical point, and obviously that's affiliate development. And that's one of the purposes of this show. We are, in fact, sponsored by the Affiliate Support Committee. Valerie Sarwak as the chair. Uh, what was your first affiliate within Connecticut? And what technique did you use to spur the love and share, you know, if you will, share the word? Yeah, so the first one that actually started uh, as a consequence of, of what we've developed over time was the Wyndham affiliate. And literally, uh, I was of the philosophy of build it and they will come. And then a few people showed up. And then we developed a, a mailing list, you know, where a few people went door to door, literally just looking for the registered libertarians and talking to them. And you know what an amazing thing happened, Pat? Uh, they realized, oh, my God, I'm not alone. And it was an excellent feeling, and, and that created uh, the community of the Wyndham County affiliate. And uh, from then on there, you know, the rest was history. And so that model uh, was was adopted, and uh, that model ended up spreading uh, around the state. And now uh, we actually had to revise our bylaws. Uh, it was right before the COVID shutdown. We actually transitioned our model, so our state central committee was more like the Democrats and Republicans where if we got up to you know 72 state central members it would evolve to the system which involves connecticut's 36 different state senate districts so we actually had to change the composition of the state central committee one thing we did that helped us grow we revised our bylaws such that if you start an affiliate and you have three meetings 
uh, and you keep holding those meetings, you elect your officers, you send us your bylaws, the SEC will not only recognize your affiliate, but you get a seat on the SEC. So if you're doing something that works locally, we recognize that, you get a seat on the SEC, and you can tell us all how you did it. And so that's kind of an incentive uh, for people who don't like the way the state party's going. They can start their own affiliates and they can change it. So once we once we got past wind and we started moving county by county, we realized we had to kind of do something a little better and put that incentive system in place. So what we're dealing with now is a system where you can have either congressional district or like, you know, local area affiliates. Like we've got the Housatonic Valley, you know, Libertarian Party, for example. I mean, it's not quite a congressional district, but it's certainly not a municipality. So the model is kind of designed to grow, like one part, like all the components come together, and the incentive model has has really driven membership. It's really driven involvement. So now let's tie the two in then, because here you have a statewide initiative. This is what's critical, because you know how do you get that critical mass going where a statewide initiative takes place and you then attract crowds, you get buy-in from the affiliates. So you, you decided to have these series of event speeches, as you mentioned, your vice chair um, was aggressively involved in promoting them. What happened then with the affiliates that existed at the time, and how did you guys use that to grow more affiliates? How did you get them to get involved in marketing? And did you spread the events around the state? Were they primarily Hartford-based? Just a little insight onto that. I mean, kind of uh, social media was kind of the basic backbone of letting everybody know we're there. But the big thing that, that works the best if you really want to um, start the fire burning is just go door to door in a place where there is no affiliate and just find the other libertarians because nothing gets your average libertarian more excited to figure out that no, they're not alone. And that's really powerful. And that really leads to regular meetings. And those regular meetings lead to more people going, there's, there's more people here and they get more involved. And so once you start going from that, you know, uh, I, I got to admit, and I think everybody can agree with this, um, COVID-19 didn't exactly come with a manual nor the, the government response to it, or at least so they say. Right. Right. Um, but as far as we go, we, didn't, we definitely didn't have a manual. So what we had to do was very quickly try to organize something that nobody was organizing in the Republican or Democratic parties because they were just afraid, you know, or they just wanted the COVID money. Or, or it's both. Um, so we were in the unusual position of having a unique product, namely being left alone, which had appreciated uh, quite a bit as an asset. So once people found out that, you know, the Liberty Rally was at first leading it, we didn't necessarily front load the LP brand, but everybody knew it was a Libertarian Party. We did reach a point, you know, especially last year, where we had to say, look, you know, it's all nice if people want to bring their Trump flags or they want to bring their Biden stuff or whatever. But, uh, you know, if you're here, we're under a common purpose. We're under a common banner. And so eventually the Liberty Rally matured such that people who had initially gotten involved uh, in other parties, they started going like, wait a minute. Um, Trump really did start that eviction moratorium. And yes, he did start uh, that whole masses are patriotic thing. And oh, yes, he did say. It's just $26 trillion, we'll pay it back, give him a few more bucks. And of course, no, he was not the president on January 6th either. Uh, so as a lot of people who just recently got involved, you know, they they were actually running into libertarians who've been around and, you know, they could, they could see, uh, you know, the forest and the trees, as it were. And so we were there to kind of, you know, not, not I, I don't think handhold is the right term, but, you know, we, we didn't. We didn't throw them off the deep end of, of the North Atlantic to teach them how to swim, you know, because right. the way persuasion works is somebody will think that they have convinced themselves of it. And it's true. And that's why they think that. So you don't necessarily um, attract people by um, there's a good guy named Michael Cloud. He wrote a book on what he called flashing. He was a very, very longtime member of the party. But uh, flashing is a term. You, you don't get people by saying like. You know, our issue is LGBTQ or our issue is crypto or our issue is like immigration. You, you don't you don't not that those aren't important. You don't lead with that. You lead with what's relevant to the voter right now. 
So, for example, you can feel very passionately about wars overseas. You can feel very passionately about immigration. You can feel very passionately about the drug war. But if you're talking to someone whose kid hasn't seen his friends in a year, or you're talking to someone who's literally lost everything because the governor decided he wasn't essential, or you're talking to like someone who's like, oh my God, uh, I'm going to lose my job unless I take this vaccine that I'm not quite confident in yet. If you're talking to all those people, or you're talking to someone who lost their business because of, because a COVID enforcer came around, or you're talking to people that are in college right now, and, and even though older people have gotten to live their lives, they're telling them not to live their life indefinitely. You're talking to all those people, and there's that one issue in front of all of them, and it is that elephant in the room. And the Libertarian Party of Connecticut has, has embraced that because we, like every other affiliate, we oppose the omnipotent cult of the state. We don't think there's an idea so good it should be mandatory. And quite frankly, I think the marketing campaign for the vaccine kind of shows that maybe it's not us that has a mess has a messaging problem. Maybe it's if you've got, you know, trillions of dollars and you've got all the force mechanisms in place and you still can't get people to take a product that you otherwise would have been had you marketed it more smart like you know it shouldn't be mandatory maybe there's something to be learned from that so what you've done effectively is take an approach that candidates have championed for years well every salesman in america you know when when, when you go to sales school the first thing they talk about is needs assessment and then following the needs assessment with an evaluation of how your product can meet those specific needs. So you're in the car business and someone said, My, I got a need for speed. You're not going to show them a minivan. Nope. On the other hand, if they've got five kids, despite the husband's pro doth protesting too much, you're going to show them the minivan and you're going to go through each safety step, probably to the more responsible spouse and guys like you and me, right? <laughs> and yep. you're going to, you're going to pitch that that's a fundamental in, 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 both sales and candidates. You know, you, how many candidates have gone on those overly advertised listening tours? But quite frankly, they work. But what you've done is taken the revolutionary step, if you will, and I'm saying it with a smile because it's one born of admiration, and, and you've taken the part of the Libertarian Party platform, if you will, that applies to their overriding concern, which for the last year or so, and, and, it, it, in, in, and believe me, as someone who lives directly adjacent to the said, you know, Soviet Workers Paradise of Connecticut. Um, I get the resentment towards, as you folks have appropriately called them, King Lamont. So it, it's that's a lesson that's universal, isn't it, Dan? Yeah, and and unfortunately, um, it's it's one that took a long time to institutionally stick. Um, and and for years, and this is something that I cannot stress. This you know, I've. I've had a total of 13 years in the party, um, the majority of it being chair. And if there's one thing I've always learned is that the Libertarian Party will go through ups and downs. They'll get a whole bunch of people that come in that, that want to build a party. They don't want to focus on wedge issues. They actually want to get out there and use their skills as salesmen, use their skills as legal professionals, use their skills as finance people, as money raisers, use those skills at recruiters or, or, or coaches or, or whatever and and they should they should feel like you know they should have the space to breathe professionally and the same is true for us social media guys um but the trouble we've run into um intermittently is uh we have people that that want to flash and what that does is sure they're they're probably right on the vast majority of the issue and they're bold and they're impassioned about it but the content to your average voter is not relevant. And what ends up happening is you drive away those people that are actually trying to use their skills and build a serious machine. Because what uh, we have found, like we, it took us a while to get this right. So bear in mind, I joined the party during the uh, Bob Barr days where literally in the entire state, we had only three or four people actually doing anything. Now, I know people will say some parties have been small, but, oh, we were small. We were very small back then. And that was one of those examples during that time period of what had happened. You know, so 
what we've kind of done is we've gotten people, you know, together. We've said like, all right, what's our mission? Everything we do, does it result in likes, shares, tweets, or does it result in people actually donating dollars? Does it result in like an echo chamber or does it result in people actively voting for us? Um, does it make us feel good and bold or flashy? Or does it actually register people as voting libertarians? Because that's the thing. And I think when we get our focus on that, rather than this faction or, or that faction, you know, or like this caucus or that caucus, I mean, Connecticut is very diverse. Um, if you want, you probably aren't going to find a wider range of like diverging caucus interests. But the thing is, we have a culture where we're all on the same team. We, we love each other. We're just like, we're, we're family. You know, we're, we're basically a family. And we kind of appreciate this from a sense that we're a company. We have a product. We want to move our product. And what we've done over the years is we've come to realize that, look, we are the free market party. However, the free market party has not necessarily paid attention to what the free market has said. Oh. You know, so instead of taking that approach, as you aptly described, the salesman approach, you know, in the past, um, too many of us had taken that approach of like, we'd really like um, you to buy our answer on this issue. You know, so instead of asking the prospect what the prospect wants, we have just assumed the prospect should right. be made to want something different than what they want. Absolutely. You know, every week we do a candidate show and I often joke about Austrian economics, which is a deadly serious subject. And I describe my affinity to learning more about it. But I also note that the average taxpayer in most towns in America neither knows nor cares a single wit, as they say, about Austrian economics. They are, however, pre-COVID, worrying about their kids graduating and, and from school and getting a better job. They are now, during COVID, worrying about their kids graduating from school <laughs> before they even, even get to that point. And all the madness that's going on. You, there's so many sentient issues. I call them lunch pail issues, which hit the average American in the gut that have nothing to do with those issues cherished by those of us in the political bubble, as I call it. You know, yeah. folks, hardcore party members in Connecticut. And I, I had the opportunity to go to your convention a, a year or so ago, and it, it was it was a, a wonderful spirited event. I had the time of my life there. One of the last things I got to do before the the COVID blackout, if you will, uh, and, 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 and that's not saying it, just had a great time all day. People were engaging in every part of the room with every piped in speaker, with the, with the candidates who, were, who made it there that weekend. It, it was just amazing. So you've got a group of people who are highly engaged. But again, how do we as libertarians, you know, pivot the battleship, right? Turn the battleship on a dime. How do we move it so that we're, with, that we're actively engaging with folks from the community. I mean, the important lesson from this is that we need more than just the members of the Libertarian Party of Connecticut to vote for Connecticut candidates, don't we, if we're going to win? Yeah, we, I think, um, and, and I hope our, our little project comes together to actually go talk to real political fundraisers, you know, mm -hmm. with real actual special interest money. And I don't say special interest in a bad way, but that's, for lack of a better term, You've got a ton of industries, like even the hospitality industry. I couldn't think of a better prospect, you know, to, to go to to say, hey, uh, the Libertarian Party, we're not going to tell you how to set up your restaurant such that you have to make your customers miserable. I mean, what, and, and, and by the way, I know there's a lot of uh, debate and confusion on like businesses setting their own rules, but, but here's the reality. Businesses basically had a proverbial gun pointed at them. And the governor said, you better do this or else. And they're always looking at everybody like who's going to actually, you know, um, rat on me this week for COVID violations. So it's not necessarily um, a, a free choice when businesses do these things. They do these things because they're being threatened and coerced. So we, I think, our next move, uh, and, and I hope as a national party as well, is to start talking to serious political fundraisers. And, and I hope that starts to lead to the formation of, you know, super PACs, because the fact is we do it the hard way. We raise money the hard way. We go, Grandma Lunch Bucket is going to give us $50, and she's going to become a member, and that's going to fund us. However, what we have to do 
is go where the real money is, where people have been aggrieved by not being left alone. And those people, I mean, if you want a $2 billion ballot access budget, that's how we do it. And, and that is one of these things, I think we can make a compelling case. You know, I think it's time we sit down with them and say, look, you know, as much as we like crypto and all these other issues, which are important to us, we, we are serious. We have a product that you, you need this product. And as imperfect as we are, we would have never done any of this, you know, and, and any candidate would have been stopped before they could have even gotten close to the nomination if they were going to do any of this. So that's one thing I think we as party leaders have to do. As far as like regular members, it is always important to just go to local meetings, you know, let them know, speak if you have public comment, but keep it relevant. You know, that's obviously not the time you go down to town hall to talk about abortion or immigration or something like that. You know, talk about local stuff and you can make a surprising difference. Like we always want at least one libertarian in town is just going to speak up even when the whole room is against it. Like I did at a local budget meeting, I said, you're giving yourselves a raise now when so many people have lost everything. I mean, being that one voice is is powerful and it leads to other voices. Absolutely. You know, what excites, I'm convinced, and I love your reaction to the statement. I'm convinced what excites certain individuals, many of them, quite frankly, are the early adopters, right? Certain individuals to connect with the Libertarian Party and most importantly, stay with the Libertarian Party are sticking to our statement of principles and sticking to our platform and being excitedly and unabashedly libertarian. I, I, I you know, the, the, the stay it safe, go along with the crowd notion has not really worked in, in sort of staying power. It's gotten us some extra votes, but I, I've got to imagine in, in, in towns across Connecticut and, and understand that it was only 100 and 200 years ago where, you know, people in Connecticut were on the forefront of the American Revolution that you're going to go and, 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 and just be a tempered existence and, and, and be careful. And I, who, who was it? Was it Dana Carvey? It wouldn't be prudent. I, yeah. Obviously, there's going to be people who are going to jump on with us early on. But those are the people for which a foundation of a political movement is made, isn't it? Uh, yeah. You know, and, and the other thing about that is um, you, you, you have to bear in mind that a lot of people um, – there's, there's a lot that a lot of people don't know, and unfortunately a lot of people don't want to know those things because it kind of gets in the way of their biases. But relevant to that, um, the thing is you, 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 have to, you have to get people to realize that there are a lot of things that we all care about. We all want our kids to be taken care of. We all want them to grow up to be well-adjusted, functional adults who could survive on their own. We all want good food. We all want a roof over our head. We all love our parents, you know, just basic things that connect us. And so what we have to do is let everybody know we're not, you know, these these cave dwellers who just coldly do not care. We just realize and, and we care that if you have the government doing a lot of these things, just because the government didn't, you know, started doing these things, it's not like nobody was doing it before. I mean, like you had things like lodge practice medicine. You know, which um, HMOs didn't like that. Health insurance uh, companies didn't like that. So, of course, they got the government to crack down on that. And healthcare was more expensive. And that's the end of the story. And it's not like we always had public schools. I mean, we used to have, I mean, especially in New England, we had schools where, you know, you had multiple age like groups. You had the older students teaching the younger students. And the school day was three hours. You weren't just grinding these poor kids with like a full work day of, wait to be educated by somebody else when the teacher gets around to you and we have to teach at the speed of the slowest student in the room. I mean, there were, there were a lot of things that we took care of on our own and we did it way more efficiently and we did it with far less expense and far less involvement. I mean, fundamentally, um, people, and this is important to bear in mind, especially during COVID, um, especially when these governors have been saying like, you're essential, you are not essential. The thing that I used to point out, it's I there's a, there's a relationship between rights and responsibilities and ownership. Okay, ownership, you know that's that's you. It's self ownership. So you have responsibilities, which you know don't hurt anybody else, and provide for yourself. But that's why you have rights. Rights exist to carry out responsibilities. So a lot of issues or people, I guess, get stuck on 
is you could take something like abortion and say, fine, you know, you have reproductive rights, but you also have a responsibility. You know, it, it can't just be one without the other. And the thing we can point out here, especially not only with the COVID response, but what Democrat, Demo Republicans have been doing the whole time, is we can say, look, they're trying to separate you from your rights and your responsibilities. You know, and if you lack one, you've got no ownership. So when the governor said you can't work or like the governor said, you know, you can't raise your kids under these circumstances, he basically said the government owns you. That's what he said. Uh, and, and that needs to be made clear. And I think we're doing a lot better of a job making that clear. But if we continue to focus on that, we can kind of get voters to put it together so as not to be trapped in this perpetual doublespeak. Where normally you got a politician that says, you ask him what a right is, he goes, oh, health care is a right, oh, food's a right, oh, education's a right. It's like, so you're using a word to define itself? Seems a bit problematic, don't you think? And we all know that nothing is a right if it depends on the labor and the forced labor of others, uh, which is an area, obviously, that they're not interested in, in having a conversation about. Uh, it's, folks, if you're just joining us, Dan Real is the chairman of the Libertarian Party of Connecticut. I've known Dan since I first joined the party. I'm proud to call him a friend and a, and a co-worker, if you will, now, uh, as I'll be working with a number of the uh, groups across New England. Uh, you know, a couple other things I wanted to focus on, but I really I, I appreciate you going through a full development of how you approached uh, the COVID era because it's um, there's some critical lessons we learn from what uh, Connecticut achieved uh, during during this time. Um, it, let's flash through in the 15 minutes or so we have left some some of the other issues. We talked about affiliate development, how you guys go about that, and it's it's a great model and, and it appears to be working very very well. You've got uh, it seems like a, a really healthy balance between local autonomy and at the same time inclusion within this board, if you will, the executive committee that 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 overall steers the ship. Uh, with you acting, if you will, as as a uh, someone who fosters the move. Let's talk about a couple of other issues, though. Uh, how do you approach the media in your state? It, it's, a, it's a fascinating market because you're right, Connecticut, we often think of Connecticut as Hartford or Greenwich. And, and quite frankly, there is, uh, the word dichotomy would be <laughs> underused yeah, there's, there. There's my part of Connecticut, which is the second congressional district, which I've run for, I'll probably to do it again. Um, it's, and that's kind of like the, the, it's the black sheep of the state. It's, you've got people in Hartford and Greenwich. They want to tell us like if we should be able to like, you know, buy a gun or even own one or like what we should do with zoning out here. And, and it's kind of like that may work for like Hartford or, or New Haven or Greenwich, but it doesn't work out here where we have farms and chickens and, you know, various like uh, wild oh, animals attacking them and whatnot. So it's it's an interesting mix. But as far as our media market goes, um, it is unfortunately consolidated and dominated. You, we used to have a lot more major media major media outlets. I know um, I, I've always told people, and I've always done this: try to develop an ongoing working relationships with local papers. Uh, I, I've I can, I'm happy to say I've developed a relationship. I was telling somebody about this the other night, but I've I've actually gotten to know like a good 10 years of newspaper opinion and editors and publishers. But I will tell you this, and this felt really good to do in 2018 uh, after we got some lawsuit money uh, from Meriden, is uh, Channel 3 was repeatedly, um, they, they, they tried to beat me up pretty bad when they interviewed me a few times. Um, and, and it's been hostile. It's it's very much been promoting the whole safetyism narrative. Uh, but we reached a point in 2018 where, you know, we wanted quotes to run television ads. We've actually run television ads on mainstream television stations. Wow. Which, that's... Well, we're on the telly. <laughs> we're actually on the television with, with Joe Biden and Donald Trump. It's It was it was just great. Uh, and, and so we got to tell Channel 3, like, well, since you treated us so poorly by ignoring our Senate candidate. Uh, how about we just take our money to Channel 8? And we did. So uh, the free market said, copy of the said your customer service is terrible. We want another product. And mm -hmm. we got more airtime. We got the airtime half as half as, half as expensive. <laughs> That's a, that, I got to tell you, dude, you know, that must have felt good. 
<laughs> oh, it, it felt great because I know uh, toward the beginning of COVID, um, I remember they had me on the Chaz and AJ show, which had a, it had a live uh, audience of 3 million people uh, because we were leading that fight. And so the host starts going off. He starts trying to yell at me like I hate grandma. And I said, all right, if you're going to do that to me, I'm going to hang up this damn phone and this interview is over. And there was pause. There was three, four seconds of dead air. And then I said, would you like to hear our side of the story? They said, yes. And I'm like, that wasn't difficult, was it? And so we, we corrected our relationship. And then I just quietly told them, you know, this is going to this is going to close hospitals. This is going to, you know, we're going to miss a whole bunch of cancer screenings. Kids are going to miss a bunch of school. You're going to have a whole bunch of deaths of despair. You know, you're going to disrupt supply chains necessary to not only dentistry, but you bring dentistry back to the 90s. When I say that, I mean the 1890s, you know, because machine tools and all that magical stuff, you know, and, and I'm saying this in April 2020. And then eventually it's kind of like, oh, and I keep asking him, do you want me back on? Do you want me to, you know, compare notes uh, to where we were? You know, because I know Connecticut, we had 200 some odd deaths per 100,000, but Malawi that had no lockdown only has eight per 100,000. And they, they're they not even mandating anything and they have no shots. So how'd we do, Connecticut? We got beaten uh, by a sub-Saharan third world African nation. We feel good about ourselves, don't we? Mm-hmm. It's, 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 this was proof of constant concept for the libertarian movement in, 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 in a way that's never happened before, in, particularly in a consolidated, consolidated period of time. Um, talk to me about events. What, what have you guys got coming up? Uh, when do you hold your convention? And if you could just do a quick segue right into ballot access. Well, uh, our convention, we're, we're setting it up for uh, January of next year. Um, I had actually uh, told my board, so I, I think I can say this here, I plan on transitioning uh, out of the role of chair, but one thing I'm doing, uh, which, and I hope more people do this, I'm actually going to be writing a chair's manual, and we have a lot of manuals. Um, I didn't even get to go into that. We actually have manuals for, like, we have an affiliate building manual. It's got all the forms. It's It's got everything. So it's not like you're flying blind because the last guy that was doing it left and, you know, he didn't give you a referential index. So as far as events, we've the Liberty Rally is going as long as COVID's going. And uh, we made it clear to the governor, uh, we will win. Uh, you will lose. And uh, you can't lock everything down and rule by one man rule forever. Uh, so going into next year, I'm hoping our, our additional fundraising concepts are, are actually going to translate into to serious political action committee money. So one thing I would say, if anybody in the party is, is watching this, uh, the time to start doing the paperwork to set up political action committees is now because Democrats and Republicans rely on the fact that our freedom of speech is only limited to $5,000 in the general and $5,000 in, in the primary. So what I would strongly suggest we do is start to set up, you know, different political action committees, get them to exist on paper, open the bank accounts, and then slowly we have to start connecting this with with the special interest industry money. And uh, I I gotta say the hospitality industry, uh, cruise ship industry perhaps. I don't know. Maybe you can think of an aggrieved specific industry subject to sector rules of your own. Maybe I don't know, but uh, let's let's get that set up. And I know the other thing that uh, we are looking, uh, you know, to do is we're we're still looking to continue to start new affiliates because. At a certain point, all of these affiliates are going to become town committees. That's the plan. Connecticut has 169 town committees. So if we can get, just like the Democrats and Republicans have, you know, even 10, like 10 people, believe it or not, that's a Democratic or Republican town committee in many towns in Connecticut. You know, I mean, the bigger towns, obviously more. But this is the thing. The reason that they succeed the way they do is and we take this lesson from them because it works they have a local like group on the ground that like knows the local people that knows everybody in town and so what they can do is if you need a petition drive done you don't need a whole lot of people you don't need a whole mass organized thing you can just go out and collect them and do it and i would like to be able to do that 
if we could get together with, you know, go after that PAC money so we could have a $2 billion ballot access fund. I mean, I think if we could kill it for a million or two million, we could probably put someone on the moon for $2 billion, you know, based on how good we are at that. So this is a question of not saying what can't we do. This is a question of asking what can we do. So if you're out there and you're a chair or you're an affiliate chair or you're a leader, it's like, that's the question you asked. And that was from, uh, that's, that's from an excellent book called The Effective Executive. Uh, read it. Actually, uh, our, one of our former chairs, Andy Rule, turned me on to that. And I was just like, wow, this is, this is an interesting approach. So we also have to remember, and, and this is one thing I think we have to bear in mind, and I don't want to miss this point, but we have to realize that we libertarians are unusual people in a good way. We're motivated by prospect of gain. The vast majority of voters you're going to run into, they're worried about the prospect of loss. And so when Democrats and Republicans sell them, they say, look at this and all these people dying from COVID. Help me. Give me your money. I'm going to protect you from COVID. And so the Republicans are like, look at all these boogeymen trying to come overseas, coming over our borders. Let me protect you from Attila the Hun crossing the border. What we need to do, and we can show this, is we need to boldly say, Here's the things government did in the name of grandma to grandma. And they ain't pretty. And they're a lot worse than COVID. So please, volunteer, donate, promote the Libertarian Party, because we're actually a lot better and healthier for grandma than the government certainly has been. That's for damn sure. Hey, uh, only got a couple minutes left. Talk to us about who you've got for running, coming, coming up running for office. We'd like to get them on our candidate show, but uh, who do you have? If any, do you have anyone running in 2021? Or are you, is Connecticut more aligned with the even year model? Uh, we have the municipal races this year. Uh, I'm running for first selectman. We've got uh, Matt Raiden, who is actually running again. He's already been on a, on the board of Ed in Plainfield, uh, which is an elected office. Uh, we actually got a second libertarian running for board of Ed, too. Uh, that's Mark Campo. I think I've, I've got a pretty good list coming up. Um, I know Matt Long was running for assessor, tax assessment appeals out in Cromwell. Uh, Richard Cordero, I think he's running for city council area six in Meriden. Um, I've got, uh, I'm actually, I have to finish this list to do the letter to the secretary of state Saturday. So there's a lot of moving parts and I know the ballot drives just ended. So we, I think we have a, we've got more than we've had for local office in the midterm. Uh, 2022, I'm hoping to focus my efforts on being a congressional candidate rather than have all these irons in the fire so uh, we could raise some money and we could actually do it if I could just be in one place. That would be nice. Uh, I think uh, Rod Hanscom is uh, going to be throwing his hat in for governor again. Uh, we've got, uh, I think her name is Elaine Chow. She has expressed interest in running for uh, Rosa DeLauro's seat in the 3rd Congressional District. Right. Uh, CD5, I'm pretty sure we're going to get that back, um, you know, because we had it years ago. Uh, so we, we are looking, that is our goal is to run every candidate for every congressional office. I believe Senate's up, same for governor. Um, our, we had an ambitious goal before COVID, which was to just get as much ballot access as we could. Like we were, we were going to go out there and crush it, but the governor was like, oh, can't have that. And when it came to the executive orders, uh, guess who those organists targeted? By the way, uh, there's probably going to be a lawsuit in the future because I did a FOIA request for the Secretary of State to see how they were trying to design these executive orders. Even the Secretary of State said, put all the libertarians on the ballot without petitions. So the governor said no. So I have a bunch of FOIA documents I'm waiting for. Uh, and even though our first lawsuit didn't go well because they used COVID as an advantage, uh, we're coming back, and uh, the second one is basically going to eat them alive for not only what they did uh, to, to cheat in court, as it were, but we're also going to eat them alive for all the federal money they took in order to keep us off the ballot. Mm -hmm. So that, um, that CARES Act money, there was a lot of Election Act funding, which was supposed to help us get on the ballot. You know, and, and my suspicion was, and I think this is why the FOIA Commission finally ordered them to turn it over, uh, I think they know I, I knew where they uh, buried the body, so to speak. And I'm just out there with an excavator. Who knows what we'll find? There you go. By the, By the way, way personally, personally, I can't, I can't wait, wait to walk, to walk the, campaign the campaign trail, trail from that long to be a tax assessor. 
the, the notion, the concept of a libertarian tax assessor is the just way too cool. So, Actually, this is cooler. Matt, Matt uh, Long is uh, tax assessment appeals. So he can overrule <laughs> the tax assessor. That would, be, yes. that, would be, that would be like putting me in charge of the speeding traffic court of appeals. <laughs> It's like, oh my God, I was holding this hammer. I seem to have accidentally tapped the lens. Yes, there's no camera. Oh, that's outstanding. No, I, I, I can't wait to testify this. now. It's broken. <laughs> I can't wait for this fall. Um, you know, I, I'm look, I, I, listen, I, I'm looking forward to walking the trail with a bunch of you guys uh, running for state and local office. It's, it's uh, as the kids say, it's going to be a hell of a good time. Uh, Dan, we've just got a minute or two left. Give us uh, we always refer to this segment as our shameless. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, you got me laughing. Um, <laughs> oh man, a tax ass assessor appeals a libertarian. Yep, <laughs> I just what he's got 100. <laughs> percent Oh, anyway, listen, shameless self promotion. Tell us, folks, where they can find the Libertarian Party of Connecticut. What events are coming up, and where they can find events, and most important, where they where they can drop a little bit of the good all, a little bit of the dough right me. Well, uh, obviously, uh, lpct.org is, is our shameless uh, plug right there, uh, forward slash donate. Uh, and, and yes, um, we, we have raised money before. We know how to do it. Um, I think uh, one of our best year was 2012. That was $80,000. We raised so much money, we got in trouble. Uh, and I know uh, during 2018, uh, we had a little incident. Uh, the mayor of Meriden threw us out of a park uh, for petitioning, and uh, we sued. And uh, we won, and I held up a picture of a $32,000 check in front of the uh, Hartford Currents reporter, and uh, then I fanned out my 50 portraits of Benjamin Franklin, and then I just pretty much said, does anybody else want to give a petitioner a problem in Connecticut? Mm -hmm. We have a fillable complaint form in PDF, all ready to serve you. <laughs> Who needs legal Zoom? <laughs> 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 Even express land. Oh man, that's that's great. It's great stuff. Well, listen, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're going to get you guys back again. One of the things we're talking about doing on the affiliate show is having the chair with with a group of uh, affiliate count in your case county or local affiliate leaders. Maybe we can get, set up a little panel conversation um, after September. And then, of course, please when you get the list of candidates together, send them on up because we'd like to get as many of them on the air as possible. To uh, to speak to libertarian, uh, to the libertarian nation, if you will. Um, remember, despite the challenges of this year, nearly two million Americans voted for Joe Jorgensen and Spike Cohen. And for all the people that might mention that we don't have that bench, well, the bench is alive and well, and it's operating in, in, in all over the state of Connecticut. Uh, and, and we're going to focus on them as possible. We're, we're not but, building a bench; we're building bleachers. There, I, I like that. We're going to take that. We're, we are actually going to misappropriate that statement. Um, so, Dan, again, congratulations. And as a fellow Region 8 person, I look forward to working alongside of you and entering the field of political battle. Uh, yes. And, and, and it, you know, it has always been an honor and a privilege, and you've always been a pal to the folks in Rhode Island. So I thank you for that. No, thank you. It's uh, always always good to venture over there when I can. And um Boy, uh, one of these days I'll actually have a, a vacation or a day off. <laughs> you and me both. Oh, yeah. man. Folks, you've been listening to the Libertarian Affiliate Spotlight, a production of the Libertarian Party Affiliate Support Committee, Valerie Sarwak serving as chair, and, of course, the Libertarian National Committee, Whitney Bilyeu serving as chair. As always, John Gapso joins us on the big board, giving us all the fun graphics, the maps, the website pages, all of that. My name is Pat Ford. It is always, as I say every week now, a singular honor to, to host and speak with the Libertarian Nation. Folks, this show is available on YouTube, on Facebook. It lives in perpetuity there. So if you want to get a little feedback or a little look at how they did it in Connecticut and how they, well, mission accomplished in terms of, of, of getting a message out during the bleak days of the COVID plague, this show will be up there for reference. Folks, we'll see you Friday night. Word has it, and we're going to confirm this, that Greg Mealy of New Jersey, who's running to be the governor of the Garden State. I bet you didn't know that. New Jersey is called the Garden State. 
will be joining us from the campaign trail. And, and I look forward to that. He is running an incredibly aggressive campaign, uh, literally going to visit virtually every major city, every burg, every township, two and three times over. He'll explain to you the perverse method, if you will, of obtaining ballot access in New Jersey. That's going to be a good one. Don't miss it. That'll be Friday night at 9 o'clock Eastern time here on LP TV. Folks, have a wonderful week. It's time to get to work. We'll see you soon.